invite you all to this exclusive webinar on HFO and oxygen -E. Time is touching 3 p.m. And we have with us Professor David Tenge. I'll just give you a brief about him. Dr. David Tenge is a clinical neonatologist and a respiratory physiologist interested in improving the respiratory outcomes of newborn infants. He is an internationally recognized expert in physiology of the deceased neonatal lung, particularly the use of advanced modes of mechanical ventilation and imaging regional lung mechanics. Dr. Tinge was awarded a PhD in 2008 for his thesis on optimal application of high frequency ventilation. Dr. Tinge has, his, has credit to his name and affiliations from NHMRC Research Fellow, Neonatal Research Clinical Sciences. He has various fellowships and awards uh, like NMHRC Clinical Career Development Fellowship, NHMRC Postgraduate Medical and Dental Research Scholarship, and various amongst others. So guys and all participants, I welcome you all to this webinar and I hope we will have a wonderful session. Over to Dr. Thinge. Thank you very much and um, just bear with me while I just start up the, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping you can see my screen and um, thank you for a very kind uh, introduction. And also thank you to the GE and SLE team for organising this webinar. And um, more importantly, thank you for all those who are attending. Um, I can't see all of you, um, which is very disappointing. And I think we're all pretty used to that this year. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be um, in India in person. This is the, the first year for a number now that I haven't been able to visit India. And, and I miss it um, very much. I've always greatly enjoyed my, my visits and looked forward to it. Um, and I hope you're all well um, and um, have had a fruitful, um, if not very complicated year this year. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, in two parts. First, oxygen targeting in the neonate. And, and I'll try to keep the presentation to about um, 20 minutes. And, and then I have another presentation I was asked to talk about high frequency, which is, of course, a very broad term. Um, but I'll try to give you a little bit of an update on the core concepts and, and a few of the new things that may be going on. Um, and hopefully, for those who want to stay, there'll be enough time for questions. I will do my best to keep to time, but I'm notoriously bad at doing that. Um, I'll, but I'll try my best today. My first presentation is on oxygen targeting. And I think, you know, this is a problem that is still very common to us, and we still spend a lot of time discussing it. But it's not a problem that's new to the neonatal clinician. We've known about the importance of um, delivering the correct oxygen now for, for, for 70 to 80 years. So um, if you think of the number of babies that would have gone in through a NICU in that time, and we're still at a point where we still don't really have a good idea about how best to do it. It is a very important topic, because as we all know, oxygen remains the most prescribed drug in the NICU. And we had a very good understanding of what the benefits of oxygen are now for, for more than 100 years. And, but in the last 50 to 70 years, we've increasingly um, understood that there are risks. Those risks, of course, uh, were initially related to the, the problem of retinopathy of prematurity um, and um, some work here in Melbourne by... Um, Professor Campbell and then uh, in the US by Professor Silverman have been fundamental to understanding this interrelationship between oxygen and ROP. Through that, we have a very good understanding around the mechanisms that lead to ROP in, in preterm babies and the role oxygen plays in that. But we don't have a good understanding around the mechanisms that lead to risk from oxygen therapy if we give too little and cause hypoxemia or we give too much and give hyperoxemia uh, beyond those of the eye itself. And as, you, and as anyone who's a fan of neonatal history will know, we've been for a number of pandemics of oxygen toxicity and oxygen fear that have been harmful for our babies. And if there is um, one topic I think that the Cochrane can show where we have being able to use evidence-based medicine to help humanity is probably in our ability to deliver oxygen to babies. 
you would think that given it's such a common therapy, it would be easy to deliver, but controlling oxygen therapy is particularly difficult. <clears throat> the gold standard measurement would be an arterial measurement of oxygen, but this is very hard for us to do in the NICU, and we use clinical proxies such as SpO2 or transcutaneous oxygen as ways of approximating PaO2, and they could, should not be considered to be equivalent to the physiological gold standard. So that's the first problem. The second problem is even if we had a physiological gold standard, it's very hard to know what the op optimum range for that measure should be. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute because it's generated a lot of debate in the last decade. Again, and then on top of that, the way we deal with oxygen, which is to deliver a fraction of inspired oxygen into the baby's lungs, um, or the, which is the intervention, and the way we measure the response to that intervention is not linear. And it is not as predictable as other interventions such as pharmacological ones would be. And PaO2, or the body's oxygenation, is not just influenced by the intervention, the amount of oxygen you inspire, but many other factors such as your ability to bind that oxygen later in the, in the, um, <coughs> in the process and, and um, the partial pressure of the oxygen that you're taking in. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And then confounding that finally is oxygen is not an agent in the body that changes in a predictable or slow way. It's rapidly changing as, um, and can change very quickly of our clinical states. So most of us have, have, are now routinely using um, peripheral oxygen saturation. These monitors are now um, widely available. They're relatively cheap. They're simple to use and they're simple to understand. Um, and most units have adopted an optimum way, target range for, for the SpO2 we want babies to have. <coughs> but what do we think we know about this ideal SpO2 range? <coughs> Depending on the unit that you're in, that range may be 88 to 92, it may be 90 to 94, it may be uh, 92 to 96 or something similar. And then we set our alarms around that. And we, we know that if you have, if you deliver, um, if you allow, allow a baby to have an SpO2 that is below an ideal oxygen uh, SpO2 range, you increase the risk of hypoxia and that increases mortality and not enterocolitis. Entro and if the number of hypoxic episodes, which is where it gets more complicated again, it's not just whether you are hypoxic all the time, it's whether you're intermittently becoming hypoxic that might be important, can actually increase your risk of ROP and may have neurodevelopmental impacts. But conversely, if you have too many hyperoxic episodes, you also have an increased risk of ROP. And if you're generally hyperoxic, you have increased risk of lung disease and ROP as well. So there's a fine balance here um, between what is good and what is bad. And if we know there's risks about being bad, then we really need to know about what ideal is. And this question of what the ideal oxygen saturation target range was has been um, addressed in the recent NEAPROM collaboration. And I think most of you will be well aware of this data. This is a really important set of randomised controlled trials and a really important way in which neonatal medicine and neonatal science has approached trying to deal with a very complicated problem. So as you would all know, stepping back from oxygen alone, um, a randomised controlled trial alone will never be enough to solve a problem generally. It, gen it is just one brick in the wall that builds the solution. And consequently, we often will have many randomised controlled trials generated around a particular topic. But because of differences in design, differences in population and differences in outcome measurements, it's often very hard to compare these trials. So at the, there was a, after the BOOST-1 trial, which is a trial of a high oxygen saturation targets, 91 um, to 96 versus lower ones, in babies who are recovering in special care and not needing primary early respiratory support, showed that there was potentially benefit in targeting a lower oxygen saturation range because it got you discharged earlier and therefore you probably, therefore you had less lung disease and likely to have less mortality. There was interest in whether that lower oxygen saturation range may be of value in early preterm life. Many people realised the benefit of um, needing to explore this question at the same time, and all of the different trial um, teams came together as they were starting their trials and said, look, we'll all do our own trial, 
but let's design the trials such that we can combine them all at the end. And, to, and let's make sure that we design the trials in a similar way that they're comparable and the outcome measures are similar. And let's use similar approaches to our trial design. For all the trials were blinded, babies were allocated to a um, Massimo saturation probe system, which had a inbuilt um, error in it, such that um, you it displayed a lower oxygen saturation range if you were in the higher range and a higher oxygen saturation if you were in the lower group and all babies in the trial were asked to target a sim the same oxygen saturation range on the vet on the display so the clinicians were asked to do the same thing for every baby um, but under but what they were seeing on the display wasn't really what the baby was um, the oxygen saturations the baby had and the idea was that you would then have babies differentiated by therapy, so some in the higher and the lower group, which is pretty clever, but it didn't quite work out as planned. Um, they randomised and recruited almost 5,000 babies in these combined trials. And when the data was pulled under individual patient analysis, they were able to show that there was no difference in the primary outcome measure, which was death and uh, or major disability excluding ROP. Indeed, about 50% of babies in either group um, either died or had a measured major disability as defined by the outcome measures. But in the subgroup analysis of these two primary outcomes, death was significantly lower in the higher oxygen saturation range group, that, that, that were targeted 91 to 95, than the lower group. And that mortality rate was almost 3%, and that on relative risk was significant. That's not a high number, but it's a pretty high number. It's not a high absolute number, but it's actually a pretty high number given the therapy that was introduced. Major disability, of course, was no different because there was no difference in the, over, in the combined primary outcomes. So this suggests that there wasn't likely to be a difference in adverse events beyond mortality if you targeted a higher range or a lower range, and that you may well result in more babies who are alive if you targeted the higher range. When one looks in detail at all of the different uh, major uh, disabilities that were included in the outcome measure, of which there were 16 um, or 15 plus ROP, there were two that favoured the lower saturation range, ROP and supplementary oxygen at 36 weeks. There's a biological reason for both of these, isn't there? Because we already knew that um, too much oxygen uh, exposed you to ROP. And presumably, if you saturate, target a lower saturation range, you'll come off oxygen earlier because that's the meat. saturation is the way we determine whether a baby needs oxygen in the first place. There were three outcome measures that favoured the higher SpO2 range, death that I've measured, uh, mentioned already, and importantly, severe NEC. So from this, this combined analysis, most of us have concluded that it is not advantageous to target a lower oxygen saturation range in babies uh, who've been born preterm in their early life, and that we should target a saturation range similar to what was targeted in the higher group for the Neoprom collaboration, and that is the group, that's the 91 to 95. Here in Melbourne, we decided to target that range. There is a slight degree of variability. Some units are targeting 90 to 94, and some are targeting 91, uh, the, the same range that was targeted in the Neoprom collaboration. But I think those sort of small changes don't really matter. But fundamentally, we're aiming to target a minimum saturation of 90 or thereabouts, and a maximum saturation of less than 96. The problem when we see all these results is that the trial design was such that babies were meant to be randomised to either a high, uh, the 91 to 95 oxygen saturation target, or the 85 to 89 sat, uh, percent oxygen saturation target, and that's what's called an intention. So the clinicians open an envelope, well, or the op and picked a, a Massimo probe which had this inbuilt randomised um, um, algorithm in it. And that's what the baby was, that's what everyone intended the baby to get. The question is, did they actually get it? And you see here the oxygen saturation frequency or distribution curves for each of the uh, major trials that contributed to Neoprom, um, showing both the low group and the high group. The high group is um, shown in blue or black, um, sorry, in blue. 
in blue or black in uh, most of them except the Kotlin there on the bottom and the low group is in red uh, in all of them but the Kotlin where it's in blue unfortunately because it was a different journal. I've highlighted with these the blue and um, pink bars where the clinicians, where the oxygen saturation should have been if the babies were getting the therapy they were given. And you can see that particularly for the low group, most clinicians didn't actually let the babies sit for most of the time in their allocated low saturation group. This was particularly the case in the support group where more than 50% of the top babies we're receiving oxygen saturation targets, which were within the other group's um, criteria. And again, in Australia, where we didn't do very well with this trial, um, we had the same sort of issue where we had very poor treatment separation. Only the COP trial got close to this. So some of this was due to the problems with the algorithms that were built into the Massimo probe for this trial, which were only found out about halfway through the trial. The other part of it is really the take home message going on here. The data is telling us that it's dangerous to keep babies saturating too low and we already know it's dangerous to saturate them too high and that we think it's probably safest to saturate them between about 91, between about 90 and 95. But it must be really, really hard to do that because here we have a trial where people are getting highly monitored as to how well they're complying and clearly they were complying very badly. So do we have any real life data to support this assertion that I'm making that it's very hard for us as clinicians to actually deliver what we think we're delivering when it comes to oxygen? And we have some data from Peter Dargaville down in Hobart here, who has been looking at this question now for quite some time. And this was the first part in his work, which has led to an oxygen targeting algorithm, which I'm going to talk about, um, where he did look in detail at how well clinicians were able to target the unit's oxygen saturation range. And at the time they did this study, which was in the sort of the era that we were targeting lower oxygen saturations. And on that unit, they were targeting 88 to 92 at the time of this study. They've now subsequently changed to the higher one, given the Neoprom data. Um, you can see here this frequency distribution curve where the bar graphs represent the portion of time that the babies in the study were at each of the subsequent, each of these saturation points. And you'll see these frequency distribution curves a lot in this talk. And again, here, and here in grey is their target range. And for those babies who are in air, you can see they're particularly bad at targeting the oxygen saturation range of 80 to 92, 88 to 92. That's not, and most of the time the babies were greater than that. That's not unexpected because when you're in air, we as a clinician have no control over babies who are saturating above your target range. We can only control their ability to be hypoxic. Um, and but still, there was about eight to nine percent of babies um, who are a median time who were hypoxic, despite the clinicians being aware they were being studied. When babies were in oxygen, you can see that again it was we were very, they were very poor at maintaining saturation target. With approximately two, you were more two times more likely to be outside of the unit's target range than in it. And when, when a baby's in oxygen, you're much more likely to be hyperoxic rather than hypoxic. Now, why is that? It's probably psychological and system based because as humans, we know hypoxia is very, very dangerous. And there is a tendency to avoid hypoxia. And we're probably not as a clinical craft group yet as aware of the dangers of hyperoxia. Um, and experience is probably what will teach that. And that came out from the secondary analysis from this work, which is in the table here, where they were able to show that proportion of time a baby was either it was eupoxic or norm or norm epoxic um, was actually strongly related to the nursing experience of the bedside nurse and also the nurse patient ratios. And in, in Tasmania, like many of the units here, we have very high nurse patient ratios. So um, they were able to show that a nurse, a baby that was nursed one to one was much more likely to be in the oxygen target range than a baby who was being nursed with one to two or greater. And there's many parts of the world that aren't able to nurse at one to two for ventilated babies. So again, it shows that achieving good safe oxygen delivery is going to depend on the human or the, per the person who's involved in, in making those decisions.
beyond the human, it's really hard because targeting oxygen saturation is not very easy because it is a poor clinical correlate and physiological correlate of, of arterial PaO2. Um, that relationship is non-linear and we all know this oxygen dissociation curve from medical school. Um, the curve is not the same in every baby or every patient. It varies between individuals and it can vary within a patient as their clinical course changes, particularly if they start to get acidotic or they start to get shock. The oxygen, tar the oxygen pulse oximeters are particularly prone to movement artifact and in states of poor peripheral perfusion, they can lead to very misleading signals. Measuring oxygen saturation is not simple with a pulse oximetry. It involves some very complex physics, particularly around how light works. And uh, as I've mentioned, there's human factors which make it very difficult. So our current, so it's through this complexity of of dealing with and managing oxygen targeting using a poor proxy of oxygen saturation that we come to thinking about how we can make it better. So we have an out, we have a intervention, which is an FiO2 blender. We change our FiO2 levels in that blender. It will initiate a change in our outcome measure, which is our baby. That is, it'll initiate a change in the PaO2 within the baby. That's our direct intervention to outcome phase. We then get some feedback as to how well we've done that. And this is no different from how we might deliver gentamicin, for example. We, we get feedback, and in this case, our feedback is using pulse oximetry and SpO2. That SpO2, from an engineering point of view, is called an input. It goes into something which has to, to input that data and interpret it make an interpretation of what it means relative to the outcome, the baby, and then decide whether there needs to be a change to the intervention or the FO2, the blender, that's the output. Traditionally, we use nursing staff for this. Um, and we should recognize that this is a really hard job and it's probably better a nurse does it than a doctor does it because they're generally much better at watching things and acting clearly, doctors get distracted too easily. But in a modern era, we could well change the nurse with a computer chip because this circle of input, output, change and feedback is happening very, very quickly when we have a measurement system, pulse oximetry, that is very rapid in terms of its data um, acquisition and, 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 and display. So it'd be perfectly reasonable to say, well, couldn't a computer deal with this and take the workload and the complexity away from the humans so they can go on and do with something else and they have busy days. And it is through this that we now have a very large number of oxygen control algorithms that are available for clinical use and have been improved, uh, approved internationally. So as you can see here, we have, um, a, we have seven available systems um, in clinical medicine, um, all of them on different devices, except for the Columbian system, which is only available in Columbia anyway. Otherwise, they're all basically linked to one particular device. Um, the one that I work with the most um, in our unit is the VDL1 uh, and VDL1.1, which is Peter Dargaville's unit, which is in the SLE. That's the Oxygenie algorithm, and so it's, it's the one I'm most familiar with, and I should declare that as my interest. Um, that, that's the only one I've used in clinical practice. Um, and these have been around now for about 20 years since the first one came out from, um, from um, Miami in the US. The early, control, the early trials of these automated controllers, um, which were all limited to the Miami algorithm, showed very consistent data. And they essentially showed again and again that it reduced the amount of time and the, and the number of episodes in which a baby would be hypoxic. Um, the earlier trials showed that there were sometimes increased periods of hypoxia, um, but these were very short in duration in the automated system, which means that the algorithms were trying to be very precise, trying to avoid hyperoxia. Um, and, but when you set something to avoid one side of the equation, it's more likely to allow the other side to occur. But reassuringly, when it did happen, if the baby became hypoxic, it very quickly was able to fix it. Um, these original algorithms are essentially what's called a rules-based system. The FiO2 is changed based on a set of instructions that are built into the computer 
um, based around SPO2 fluctuations. So there's a series of questions that are yes and no that lead to a decision. And, and that, that series of questions that the system has to make uh, are, have been put in by clinical experts. So they're not physiological per se, they're what we call um, preset decision tables. That potentially allows a problem because if you've basically built your system around a series of rules that have been determined by clinicians, then it's at the start of the process, it's always going to be arbitrary. The, the algorithm can only deal with the questions it's been asked to, to answer, and it can only work within the rules that it's been allowed to give. It also means that there is theoretically slower transition time with the decision making, and um, there, and the system is unable to change during preset FO2 rule periods, um, because which means it may be unresponsive during periods of refractory desaturations. Rules are in fundamentally linear. It's a yes, no, or a maybe. But the relationship between PO2 and SPO2 is not linear. And you can see the problem here with having a simple linear rules-based system. If we are managing a baby who's right near the top of this uh, oxygen dissociation curve, a change in PaO2 of 20 millimetres of mercury, or about, um, that, that's about three or four kilopascals, will result in only a 1% change in oxygen saturation, which is something that's very unlikely a clinician or a computer chip is going to pick up and think is important. But there's no doubt that changing PaO2 by 20 millimetres of mercury is highly clinically important for the baby. But we won't know that um, because we're not measuring PaO2 and the system applies the same linear change to everything. But if you're down on the, um, on the straighter part of the dissociation curve, here you can see a very small change in PaO2 will lead to the same 1% change in oxygen saturation. So if you're managing a baby down here with a very linear system, to, you, to change PaO2 by 20 millimetres of mercury will result in a 20% change in oxygen saturation, whilst it will only be 1% here. So it's these problems which have led to the more the current generation of oxygen control algorithms, which have designed to be more responsive. They've designed to be adaptive, which means they deal with the problem of the patient at that time. It's more precision medicine based. They're designed to be more intuitive and try to learn from the decisions that are being made and somewhat no different than your washing machine and the fuzzy logic in your washing machine. They're designed to be receptive to the input that's coming in and they're designed to be more clinically usable, which is what the attractiveness is. And it's the adaptivity and the intuition that is allows the devices to work within the dissociation curve, at least theoretically better than the older systems. And these systems are called proportional integral differential PID algorithms. Um, it's pro they're proportional because they calculate the difference between the input measure and the target, which is oxygen saturation. They then look at the change in that difference over time, the integration, and they look at the speed of the change, which is the differentiation. And it's that final bit which allows them to work within the complex nonlinear relationship of the oxygen dissociation curve. And this is what we expect to see with these um, newer generation of algorithms. And this is some data um, that's been published on the Oxygeni one. Here you can see a uh, on the left hand side under man manual oxygen control, you can see a recording over a period of about two hours um, of oxygen saturations. That's the dark black bars in the top there and the gray bar across it is where the oxygen targeting was in that unit. Um, and below it at the bottom, you can see the FO2 that was being delivered, which as you'd expect um, when you have a baby who's on manual control, FO2 is not changed that often over a two hour period and that's seen here. And you can see that the oxygen saturations are flicking in and out through that whole course of the time. That's normal human variability, but you can see that frequently the baby will go in and out of that range and the FO2 makes very little change because the human's not able to identify the rapid changes occurring on oxygen saturations in their busy day. Um, 
but then you can see in the next panel um, two recordings when the automated oxygen control is on over the same rough period of time, approximately two hours. In the top panel, you can see a baby who's pretty stable. Um, their oxygen saturations are relatively um, similar to the, the manual control example there. But you can see the difference being that the FO2 being delivered is highly variable compared to the other group. And with the benefit of um, faith, you could potentially say there seems to be less uh, black lines going out above and below the grey bar there. What we're seeing in the in the panel below that though is a baby who's becoming clinically unstable and this is where the um, more novel algorithms are potentially more um, attractive because um, it's hard to see in the panel of oxygen saturations, which are um, the darker grey black lines with the grey bar there in panel C. It's hard to see them changing and going out of range. But what you can see is the FO2 has been going up proportionately in the last hour. And you can see just prior to that happening, you can start, you can see that there are some variations occurring here. So the baby's clinical state has changed and the machine has adapted to that by slowly and sequentially increasing FO2. And what we do when you set these up is you firstly um, tell the system um, what oxygen target you wish to use, um, whether it's 90 to 94, 92 to 96, 91 to 95, or and there's various default settings on all of the different um, manufacturers' machines. You also ask it how responsive you want the system to be, you also provide some detail about the alarm limits and you provide some detail to the system around what the overriding should be um, because you don't want a fully automated system. You want the opportunity for the clinician to be able to rapidly override the uh, algorithm in times of emergency. Um, and in the system that we use, the Oxygenie, you can just simply press the FO2 and increase the FO2 at that point uh, very rapidly and the baby will go straight to 100% and it turns the device off. If you go to 100% rapidly, it does it just for a transient period of time. But if you do it, um, you can also um, set it so you can turn the device off when you um, at any time very easily. Um, it, how the system behaves depends somewhat on the FO2 that the baby's in at the time you start the PID algorithm. In my personal experience, we've found that to be a little bit more accurate if the baby's in a little bit of oxygen rather than air at the time the baby started. Um, and what we've found in our personal experience using it in our unit um, with um, generally older babies or chronic uh, BPD babies is that the, the unit, that it is very effective at targeting the mean or the middle point of the oxygen saturation that target that you're set. So if you target 92 to 96, for example, it is very accurate at, at, a ta at targeting 94. Um, it doesn't try to keep the baby at 92 or 96. It tends to target the middle point. And here in the last panel uh, on the right there, you can see, again, this his frequency distribution curve and you can see that the when the oxygen targeting is on with one of these more modern algorithms you can see a very high rate um, a higher rate of time that the baby is in the desired target oxygen saturation range compared to um, the manual target range these automated systems don't exclude all hypoxic and hyperoxic systems uh, they just reduce the incidence of them We've got some data to show that these systems are able to rapidly respond to um, clinical changes in babies and reduce in crossover trial designs the amount of times that babies um, are outside of their targeted range. We've now got a large number of studies that have been published and I summarise some of them here and I show the different algorithms in blue. And you can see that irrespective of what system you use from the older ones through to the newer ones, they all show a constant pattern, which is that they reduce the amount of time a baby is outside of the desired target range for that study. And they do so roughly to about the 10 to sort of 15% range, which is not insignificant. What we don't know yet is what it means to have tighter oxygen saturation targeting and tighter FO2 delivery. Here's an interesting study which came out two years ago. It's quite small. It uses a PID algorithm um, on, which is not um, the Oxygenie system. It's a different one. And it showed this very constant finding of improved um, oxygen delivery and, and reduced times outside of the eupoxic range. But when they looked at um, 
near infrared um, spectroscopy recordings of STO2 in the brain, the liver and the kidney, which are measures of oxygen consumption, there was absolutely no difference between the manual and the automated groups. So we don't yet know whether tighter and better oxygen targeting using these devices actually results in better end organ tissue perfusion. And that's going to be important as we move forward. Here is a summary of the current studies that are ongoing. Um, most of them are starting now to move into different settings, such as the delivery room or non-invasive ventilation. Um, we only have one, though, that's a large RCT, uh, which is happening in Germany, which is looking at whether the use of uh, oxygen targeting algorithms and oxygen control can actually reduce death and BPD. Um, and we don't yet have any published studies which have compared different oxygen algorithms They've all compared one particular algorithm to a manual one. So this is my final um, uh, information slide. So when it comes to oxygen automated oxygen controlling, what do we know and what do we need to know? We know that if we use these modes, they're very easy to use clinically and they increase the time that you're in the desired saturation range, which means less and shorter hypoxic and hypoxic hyperoxic event compared to human control but we don't yet have long-term outcome data to show that there's an improvement using this technology. And we don't yet have comparative studies to show whether one algorithm is better than the other. We still don't yet know what the correct outcome measure is for these trials. Death and BPD may not be the right outcome measure. I've often argued that possibly we need to look at health economic outcome measures with these. If they're safe, not dangerous, but improve the ability of the nursing staff to do other tasks because they don't have to worry about oxygen, then that in itself may have an indirect or secondary benefit um, that we need to consider. We don't yet know what the right populations are for using this technology, and we haven't yet fully understood the risks. So automated oxygen control treats extremes of SpO2 it doesn't treat the cause. And this is the thing that I think you need if you're going to use these technologies in your NICU, you need to think about as you integrate them in. So just because we don't see an abnormal SpO2, it doesn't mean that a baby's not getting sicker because the reason the SpO2 is not abnormal is that the ventilator has automatically increased the FO2 for you and you've not had to be aware of that. So our measures that we use to determine a deteriorating baby and now being taken away from us. So we need to change how we diagnostically approach clinical instability. And we need to now move our clinicians, if we're gonna use these technologies, from not looking at SpO2, but starting to look at the relationship between SpO2 and FO2, and starting to look at heart rate as measures of instability. So that's where I was gonna leave it. Um, we have been receiving questions since the start of this uh, webinar. Uh, the first question is that, uh, please share some clinical conditions when we should use HFO. Yeah, okay. Well, I wonder if that's a question I'd better deal with on my next talk rather than this one. Because this, oh. my next talk's on HFO, right? Okay. I'm just so, gonna... uh, so I'm going ahead I'm with just... the second question. Yeah, I've just the problem I have is that my PowerPoint has frozen, unfortunately. So, and I seem to not be able to delete it. Okay, so I'm going ahead with the second question, sir. Yeah, that would be. Is great. it higher mortality in lower SpO2 group and higher ROP in uh, higher group? That that's well, that's well, that's there's higher mortality. That's correct. Um, um, and if you tar we know from other studies that if you hire, if you target, and, and yes, in the higher group, the 91 to 95 group, there was a higher rate of ROP. Now, that, that required treatment. And this is part of the ethical conundrum, is what is the worst outcome to deal with? Um, there was a question early on about high frequency. So I, I think I must move on very quickly and, and talk a bit about high frequency, and then we can see what questions there are, and hopefully we'll get through this one without any problems. Um, unlike um, unlike um, oxygen targeting, high frequency is not a new therapy. We've, we've had uh, oxygen, high frequency devices that have been very clinically useful and clinically accurate now um, 
since the late 1980s and in widespread neonatal practice from the early 90s. This is not a new therapy and for many of us it's something we're quite used to using but we still always struggled a little bit with trying to understand how best to deliver it to babies. Part of that is because the original oscillators didn't have good monitoring systems um, and the newer oscillators that are now hybridly in built into ventilators like the SLE and other devices um, do have um, much better monitoring systems. So as a refresher for you, there's really only three things that we need to worry about with high frequency. One is clearing CO2, the other is setting the frequency, and these two things are intimately related, and the last one is setting the mean airway pressure. They're the only real things we have to change on the oscillator. So we have to decide who we're going to use it for, and then we have to decide how we're going to use it appropriately. To remind you, High frequency is very effective at removing CO2 and it does it by the combination of the frequency of the high frequency oscillations and the size of each of those oscillations. So as you can see in this little graph here, basically the os uh, oscillator develops a high frequency oscillatory wave and in the neonatal devices these are delivered at 5 hertz or greater and for most babies at 10 hertz or greater. Um, and that wave has a classic sinusoidal oscillation and it's the area within the wave that is the amount of tidal volume we deliver. And the amount of tidal volume we deliver to the lungs det determines our CO2 clearance. On conventional high frequency, uh, conventional ventilation, CO2 clearance, as you all know, is tidal volume times rate. But on high frequency, it's much more complicated because CO2 clearance or minute ventilation or DCO2, they're all the same thing, is equal to the rate, which is the frequency, times the VT squared. And the VT squared is the area under this curve here. And we can alter the area under this curve in two ways on high frequency. We can increase the amplitude or delta P we set and that will make each wave we deliver bigger. And you can see, therefore, we will give a bigger area under the curve. And this is why this is the most common setting that we will use at the bedside to change CO2. For most clinicians on a day-to-day -day basis, if our CO2 is too low, then we will reduce our delta P or amplitude. If our CO2 is too high, we will do the opposite. And that's because we have such a big effect on CO2 clearance because tidal volume is squared. The other way though that we can do it is to decrease the frequency. So give less oscillations at the same amplitude. When we do that, you can see that we are actually increasing the area under this curve um, significantly more than when we use a faster amplitude. And that's why on high frequency, when you decrease the frequency, you can get very effective CO2 clearance. And indeed, if you decrease the frequency too much, you can make a baby very rapidly um, hypocapneic. Um, but day to day, we will generally just change our amplitude because it's so efficient and it's easy to do. It's also the way to go because frequency is much more complicated than on conventional ventilation when you compare it to rate on a conventional ventilator. On the conventional ventilator, it's an independent variable, the rate. You increase the rate, you decrease the rate. It affects CO2 and doesn't really affect too many other things. But on the oscillator, if you, affect, if you change frequency, it affects the time that you will be spending in inspiration and expiration to a greater degree than conventional. And frequency in itself is influenced by many factors. Unlike conventional ventilation, the optimum frequency is actually weight related as well. So the smaller the patient, the higher the frequency should be. And that means the opposite. If you're a very, very big patient, you should have a low frequency. So for a one kilo preterm baby, the frequency that will be correct is not the same as for a three kilo term baby and definitely not for a 50 kilo adult. And you can see that there's also this interrelationship between frequency and tidal volume. So frequency is really quite important and we have to think about how we're going to deliver it.
It also depends on the disease. So if you take these two different conditions, on the left here you can see a baby who clearly has acute surfactant deficient lung disease. So this is a preterm baby with HMD. The problem here is surfactant deficiency. That's a problem of lung compliance. And that means that this lung wants to collapse. It really wants to collapse. It wants to be as atelectatic as it can be. And that's the physiological problem that we have to overcome at the bedside. And this lung actually has a very short time constant because, um, because compliance is so poor. But if you take the x-ray on the right, you can see this is actually the same baby many, many weeks later that we have a very different lung disease. Here we have a baby with very nasty macroscopic cystic PIE. And on the x-ray you can see all of those hallmarks we use for over distension. The diaphragms look flattened, the number of ribs uh, where there's aeration looks considerably more than you'd expect. More, uh, very worryingly, the heart is very compressed, so you'd be very surprised if this baby had normal uh, left and right ventricular output. And you can see this awful characteristic sign of bulging of air between the rib spaces. Here, the problem is clearly not atelectasis. Here, the problem is gross over distension. So the way that we set the frequency will have a direct impact on the outcome for these two babies. When we talk about frequency, we talk a lot about the inspiratory tidal volume, but the frequency also determines the expiratory tidal volume. So in the baby of overdistension, we want as long a period of time in expiration as possible. So we don't want to have a lung being exposed to very short expiratory times. So this baby will need a low frequency to allow the lung to deflate in expiration. Um, it's also likely this baby's bigger, so again, a lower frequency is, is, is valuable. In the other baby with atelectasis, you don't need a long time for the lung to deflate. In fact, you don't want this lung to deflate. You want to shorten the amount of time it's exposed to deflation. And also, it's a lung which is very prone to getting the sort of lung injury events that will lead to PIE, and we know that volute trauma is a contributable part of that. So in that case, you want a very fast frequency because you give very small tidal volumes, that's likely to be more protective to the alveolar lining, and you allow the lung to move very quickly because you're not so worried about the time it takes to inflate and deflate because it can do it quickly. So in our unit, this is the way we set our frequency, and this is something we've been doing now for many, many decades. Um, we think about the size of the patient, and we think about the disease. If we have a baby of preterm HMD, we will set the frequency between 12 and 15. Small tidal volumes, fast rate, short expiration, and a very fast frequency for a very small person. So all of the ideal settings to, to justify that high frequency rate. If we're using one of the Draeger devices, we tend to set our frequency about two lower than if we're using the Sensormedics or um, the SLE or um, the um, Fabian. Um, that's just because it's a very, it, it delivered, the, the Draeger devices deliver high frequency in a slightly different way, and you generally need a little bit longer to be able to get effective delta P uh, per, uh, delivery. So as a general rule, I drop my frequency by two on a Draeger device. If I've got early PIE, PIE evolving in a prem baby, I use a very fast frequency still, because at this point, this baby is at very, very high risk of volume trauma related injury, and the best way to minimise that on high frequency is to use a high frequency. If I've got established PIE with gas trapping, high CO2s and a high FO2 and that sort of nasty chest X-ray I showed you, I would generally start my frequency at 8 to 7 on the SLE or the Sensomedics. And if that baby's not showing response, then I will reduce my frequency down to 6 to 5. And in those babies, we often, to recover them, have to give them a very short one or two day period of deep sedation or muscle relaxants to allow their lungs to, to properly decompress. If I have a term baby with primary lung disease like pneumonia or, or, or RDS, 
I will use a frequency generally between about 10 to 12, often 10, that's just because it's a nice number in Australia, because that baby has the same problem the preterm baby has, but is three times bigger on average and needs a lower frequency. If I have a baby of meconium aspiration, I will use a lower frequency again. Those babies are often large, they're term or greater, and they often have a component of gas trapping in their lung disease, which means that they do need a lower frequency than primary atelectatic lung disease. So we generally start those babies at 10 to 9 and then reduce them down to 8 to 7. It's been very hard to measure in the past tidal volume during high frequency. So the other part of this is what delta P should we set? And given that's the determinant of tidal volume, what tidal volume should we set? And here's some old data now show in a series of babies um, with very old versions of these devices showing that on average babies are delivering, are receiving about two to two and a half mil per kilo tidal volumes um, during high frequency. But at times these tidal volumes are over three and up into sort of physiological rather than super phys uh, sub physiological ranges. And it's because um, we know that in conventional ventilation, controlling tidal volume delivery has very strong and important improvements in outcomes, both mortality and BPD, and adverse events like air leaking, air leak, that we want that people have started to think about whether we should be targeting tidal volume during high frequency too. Um, the difficulty being in high frequency that we're dealing with very, very small tidal volumes. And here you can see a graph of um, um, a spectrum of different tidal volumes that were delivered when volume targeting was on and when volume targeting was off using high frequency. You can see that when volume targeting was on in the black dots here, they were that um, oscillators are able now, the modern oscillators, to deliver a very accurate tidal volume to babies irrespective of the frequency. But when tidal volume was turned off, you can see this linear relationship where at higher frequencies you get a lower tidal volume than you do at lower frequencies, which I've explained just earlier a minute ago. But you can see that there's a potential advantage if we can trust the algorithms to, do, to have volume targeting in high frequency, just like we do in conventional, because it will allow the device to adapt as we change our delivery approach um, with disease changes. Do these algorithms work? We have very limited data, and the data is generally observational reporting data. The largest set is from um, Colin Morley's group in Cambridge, where he reported where they, they reported many thousands of inflations over many, many seconds or many, many days of data, and actually showed that when volume targeting of high frequency was on, that the majority of the time that the machine was delivering a tidal volume that was within 0.2 millilitres per kilo of what the clinician wanted the machine to deliver, which is actually pretty good because the error range on the flow sensors being used is in that 0.1 mil per kilo range anyway, which means that the algorithm is probably pretty good because it's that the limits are within the limits of the hardware, not the software. So, we don't have any clinical trials for using volume targeting in high frequency, but it is now a mode that is available on all modern oscillators and is really not available only now on the Sensomedics, which is a de device which has been phased out um, because the manufacturer is not supporting it. So clinicians are now struck with this problem of, well, well do I use this technology or not? Um, and we don't, the problem is we have two, two issues here. One is, What's the strategy we use? Because it's not the same as conventional ventilation volume targeting or volume guarantee. And secondly, does it actually make a difference? And we don't know if it makes a difference yet because we have no large clinical trials. We do have a trial coming, the Dove trial from the US, um, which didn't look at clinical outcomes such as death and BPD, but was more interested in how accurate the algorithm was. But when the trial is published, we'll hopefully get some insight as to whether we'll get some clinical benefit from these, these, these algorithms. So at the moment, I can't say to you, you should be using volume targeting. And indeed, in our unit, we don't use it that often. Um, um, what I, but if you are thinking of using it, then I think you have to think about how you're going to do it. And there's, there's two clinical approaches. One is the simple one here I called option B, 
um, which is where you, when you put a baby on high frequency, you turn volume targeting on and you set the volume target at between two and two and a half mil per kilo, because that's about the median that most babies in the studies that have measured this have reported. You adjust your upper delta P limit or amplitude limit so that it is about five centimetres of water above what's needed to deliver that set tidal volume, just like you do with conventional volume targeting. Um, and then you stabilize and set your frequency for the disease you're treating and you note the DO2 value. And then you measure your CO2 and work out whether two to two and a half mil per kilo um, tidal volume or volume guarantee is what actually this baby needs, because we don't know. The alternative is you start high frequency in a baby without volume targeting or volume guarantee, but you have the monitoring in place. And this is what I do. Because I've been using high frequency for 20 years, I know how to start it. And I've been most of those 20 years, I've not been using volume targeting. So I start it the way I'm used to it. I'm it, and that's the way the nurses are used to it. Then I stabilize the baby. I work out the right mean airway pressure. I work out the right frequency. And then I work out what delta P is needed to give the baby the CO2 I think the baby deserves having, or I correct the abnormal CO2 problem. And then I look at what tidal volume that baby needs to give stable and appropriate CO2s, and that becomes my volume targeting limit, and then I turn it on. So I do what I'm good at, and then I turn it on once I've worked out what the baby needs. And I watch my DCO2 levels in case I change my frequency. Because if you change your frequency with any of volume targeting modes in high frequency, you will need to change your tidal volume. Because the frequency alters the tidal volume approach that baby's getting in the minute ventilation. So I'll just move on to the issue of now. So how do we set mean airway pressure? We know if we read the Cochrane reviews that we should always use a high lung volume strategy which means a mean airway pressure above conventional and a mean airway pressure, uh, and we wean our FO2 before we wean our mean airway pressure. So we wait till the baby's recovered at that high mean airway pressure before we start weaning it, or we use recruitment maneuvers. That's what the Cochrane tells us we should use if we're gonna safely use high frequency in a baby. But the devil's in the detail here. Firstly, the Cochrane review is simply only referring to preterm babies with early acute hyalur membrane disease because all of the studies were prophylactic high frequency studies. They do not tell us how best to apply high frequency in term babies or older preterm babies with other pathologies. And secondly, we need to actually look at whether the trials did what they said they were doing and whether a high lung volume strategy was used. This is the largest, one of the two largest trials, which is Sherry Courtney's trial, which is 18 years old now, in very preterm babies who are randomised um, at um, intubation to high frequency or conventional. Um, and they were very, it was a very well designed study with very formalised high frequency and conventional strategies, both of which we would consider lung protective now. Um, and there was no difference in um, uh, mortality between the two groups. But there was a reduction in survival without BPD that was just clinically significant if high frequency, uh, an improvement, sorry, in survival without BPD if high frequency was used. When we look at the treatments the baby's got, and that's what's shown here in the graph, you can see the mean airway pressure over the first week of life for the high frequency group in black and the, the conventional group in, in open circles. And you can see that the, the high frequency group got a much higher mean airway pressure than the conventional group, which means they were delivering a true high lung volume approach. And there was an improvement in a lung protection, but not mortality. The same as the other large study is the UK UCOS trial, which was a larger trial, but slightly larger trial in similar babies. Um, that was much less uh, rigorous in its clinical strategies. Um, on review of the trial reports, they didn't truly meet their criteria for a high lung volume strategy because they, did, they, they didn't meet their FO2 target um, in the high frequency group. But also as can seen in this graph here, the mean airway pressure between the conventional and the high frequency groups were exactly the same. So unlike the Courtney trial, these two groups, uh, whatever, whatever, if you were in this trial, didn't matter what uh, strategy you were randomised to, you actually got the same mean airway pressure. 
and there was absolutely the same mortality rates and absolutely the same survival without BPD, which tells us that the mean airway pressure we deliver in babies with hyalin membrane disease is probably really important to the outcome we're going to get. And it may not be how we deliver it, whether it's high frequency conventional, maybe the fact that we just need to make sure we give them a high mean airway pressure and therefore a high lung volume. And the most recent European consensus on uh, RDS in prematurity, which came out at the end of last year, says that when high frequency is being used in the NICU, an open lung approach should be used on initiation to determine the right mean airway pressure. And what is this phrase, open lung approach or open lung concept? It's now quite old. It comes from Luckman, who was an adult intensivist, which is a, and it basically describes a strategy where you achieve lung recruitment. You open the lung up to ventilation. You then identify the lowest pressure that maintains that recruitment. You find the closing pressure. You then reopen it because when you find the closing pressure, you expose the lung transiently to atelectasis. That's called exploiting hysteresis. And then you keep it open by providing the lowest mean airway pressure or PEEP that maintains that recruitment. And this is what it is in practice. So here you can see a baby who um, has severe oxygen uh, deficiency. The baby, this is a clinical case um, from Tasmania. It's a baby who's in 100% oxygen, born at 28 weeks, failed non-invasive ventilation and being intubated and placed on conventional ventilation and is not doing so well with poor saturations and is currently on a mean airway pressure on conventional 12, and they decide to put this baby not unreasonably to high frequency because most of us use it as a rescue therapy in these sort of circumstances. And like most units, they started at two centimetres of water above conventional, which is the standard approach. That's absolutely fine. It makes no physiological or medical sense unless you start two centimetres of water above conventional and then you see what happens and you change it if you need to. So this ba if this baby on a mean airway pressure of 14 and very rapidly improved and gone down to 30% oxygen to maintain good saturations, there's nothing more one would need to do. You would say that this baby had, you'd pick the right mean airway pressure. But after a few minutes at that mean airway pressure, there was some improvement, but the baby was still in very high FO2. So the clinicians felt that whilst they'd started two centimetres of water above conventional, they had not really resolved this baby's problem of atelectasis. So this pressure wasn't enough. So they continually and slowly every two minutes increase the mean airway pressure by two and watch the response. And this is classic, this is true individualised healthcare because as they increased the mean airway pressure, they saw the baby's saturations improve, which is telling us this baby was very atelectatic and the higher mean airway pressure was resolving that atelectasis. When they got to a mean airway pressure of 20, they were able to reduce the FO2 down to 50% from 80% earlier and still had better saturations. Clinically, they have shown that this baby had recruited its lungs. But when they went to 21, at that FO2 of 50%, the baby's saturations deteriorated, telling us that likely we're now getting a negative effect from mean airway pressure. We're either getting cardiac compression or we're getting over distension. So any further increases in mean airway pressure would be deteriorous to the baby and would be rather stupid to do. So what do we do now? We don't want to stay at that high mean airway pressure because it's clearly the point where we're getting some harm. So the open lung approach says, well, actually, the way the lung recruits is very well understood, but the way the lung behaves once it's recruited is entirely different from how it recruits. And this is called the pressure volume relationship. And once the lung's been recruited, taken at a high mean airway pressure, if you decrease the mean airway pressure, it will stay recruited and to a much lower mean airway pressure, and then it will suddenly become atelectatic, and that's called the closing pressure of the lung. And from the open, the open lung strategy says the sweet spot or the best place to provide mechanical ventilation uh, with high frequency is at a mean airway pressure that is about two to five centimetres of water um, above uh, uh, the point where the lung derecruits or becomes atelectatic. And clinically at the bedside, that's the point where a lung that has improved on high frequency with increasing mean airway pressure suddenly becomes, uh, the baby desaturates as you decrease the mean airway pressure.
So the clinicians knew this, so they slowly decreased the mean airway pressure every two minutes by two centimetres of water. And as they did so, they could see that the baby was able to maintain its saturations, showing us that this lung was now on the deflation limb. It had been recruited. We changed its state from atelectatic to recruited, and now it's recruited, it's a different lung and it's behaving differently. And it will keep that lung recruitment into a much lower mean airway pressure. And in fact, they got down to a mean airway pressure of 10 and were still able to keep this baby in their target range of the low 90% saturations. When they dropped the mean airway pressure to 8 though, the baby very rapidly deoxygenated, telling us this lung has now become atelectatic again. We're right back where we started and we've got a hypoxic collapsed lung. The open lung approach says, well, just, you know, just a few minutes, you actually knew what the pressure was needed to recruit the atelectatic lung, and that was 20 centimetres of water. That's what fixed this baby when we started, when the baby was atelectatic. We've made the lung atelectatic again, so we can go straight back up to 20, because we know it was safe when we did it a few minutes ago, and they did that, and very quickly the baby's saturations improved. And then they said, well, because the baby's now recruited, we can now the optimum mean air pressure or the best mean air pressure to apply is about two to five centimetres of water above the closing pressure. So we're looking at somewhere between about 10 and 13 centimetres of water and they chose 11 and they finished the process there and the baby is now much better off. Um, and this takes about 20 to 25 minutes to do this approach to managing acute HMD. And it's been reported now in a number of observational studies, no randomised control trials. And all of these studies have reported the same things when they're compared to historical controls in that it is able, you're able to recruit the lung very easily in preterm babies on high frequency when they've got acute HMD, that generally you need mean airway pressures um, that are much higher than we'd be used to in clinical practice. So many babies need about between 16 and 22 for the preterm babies. And then in many cases, you get a significant reduction in um, the, the FIO2 needs. Um, and in some studies compared to historical controls have showed shorter durations of ventilation. But these approaches, which are, and this is the approach, this open lung approach is now the approach um, recommended in Europe for managing uh, RDS with high frequency. It's really important we understand when you shouldn't do such an open lung approach. An open lung approach treats HMD, and it treats HMD because HMD is a disease where the lung is atelectatic. So, the only times you should ever do an open lung approach is in atelectatic lung disease, such as um, diffuse pneumonia in the term baby, um, the MAS with clear parenchymal disease and surfactant deficiency, and preterm HMD. You should never do a high lung volume strategy or an open lung approach if the lung is not atelectatic. And it's an absolute contraindication if you have any pulmonary hyperplasia. So if the baby has pulmonary hyperplasia due to prolonged uh, ruptured membranes prior to birth, you should never do a lung recruitment manoeuvre. And indeed, most of us would use a mean airway pressure lower than conventional if we were going to oscillate these babies. One should never do an aggressive recruitment manoeuvre in congenital diaphragmatic hernia because that's not a... That's not a de-recruited atelectatic lung, it's a hyperplastic or small lung. In fact, maybe well recruited, there's just not enough of it. And when you have primary pulmonary hypertension. And finally, when should we extubate our babies uh, if they're on high frequency? In our unit, we extubate babies generally directly from high frequency to CPAP. Uh, this is not something that many units do, but I know in, um, in the Netherlands they do the same, and this data is from the Netherlands where they reported their experience extubating directly from high frequency preterm babies who are in less than 30% oxygen with a mean airway pressure of 8 or less, a delta P of less than 15, and good work of breathing and stable pH. And they showed that extubation directly from high frequency was successful in 90% of infants. And we have a similar strategy for our term babies. We just allow them to have slightly higher mean airway pressure and delta Ps, um, but the same criteria for FO2 and pH. And we find that it works very well for us, but we don't have any published experience yet. I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I may start with the questions. Uh, we have received a lot many questions and I have tried to collect them all into one or two questions each. 
So basically, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation and wonderful explanation of the concepts. Uh, the first, though have, you have already answered many of the concepts, but I'll still go with the questions. What should be the criteria for putting HFO on and how to wean off from HFO? What about nasal HFO? Yeah, so nasal HFO is not HFO in the same way. They're very different therapies, and I haven't spoken about nasal HFO. I'm talking here only about using traditional high-frequency via an endotracheal tube. The, the indications for using high-frequency, the most important indication is not the patient's disease. The most important indication for invasive high-frequency is do you have the staff who and the clinicians who are comfortable using the therapy and who know how to drive the oscillator in your unit? Because if you don't know how to apply high frequency safely and have some experience in it, the clinical trials, particularly the early trials done in the 1990s, like the HIFI trial, have showed us that you can cause very big harm with high frequency. High frequency for RDS, uh, HMD and preterm babies, is very efficient at improving oxygenation and reducing CO2. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can do those things too quickly and put babies at high risk of air leak and high risk of brain injury. And that's what the early trial showed. So I think the, uh, the most important indication is that you as a clinician and you as a unit have a comfortable experience using it in that disease you're using it for. Then I think for most of us, we use high frequency as a rescue therapy. And I think your criteria for what disease you start with depends a little bit on the unit. We are a very high frequency, um, comfortable and pro unit in our NICU, and we would put babies on high frequency with levels of pneumonia or um, chronic lung disease or HMD or MAS or CDH um, that other units wouldn't think of using because they're more comfortable with conventional. But I think as a general rule, apart from primary pulmonary hypertension and primary cardiac disease, i.e. where there's no lung disease, whatever, um, I think high frequency is an effective rescue tool for virtually every lung disease where there's primary parenchymal lung problems of some form. Um, and I think in the right hands, it's very effective. Nasal high frequency is different. With high frequency oscillatory ventilation, we're trying to rescue a very, very sick lung generally, whatever the pathology. With nasal high frequency, what we're trying to do is to provide a little oscillatory wave in the back of the pharynx with the view that we're moving the dead space around and creating effectively a very fancy form of bubble CPAP. And I haven't spoken about that. I wasn't asked to talk about nasal high frequency because it's a different therapy. And I think we, we don't yet know exactly what to use it in. Um, We've published a bit of data on this, and there's some work that we've just had recently published in the Blue Journal, the Thoracic Society Journal, looking at how those oscillations are occurring in the lung during nasal high frequency. And it is definitely true that with nasal high frequency, we are washing dead space out and tr creating some transmission into the lungs. But we're probably also stimulating the babies, and that helps them breathe. I think... Nasal high frequency is unlikely to be an effective, unlikely to be an important alternative to just CPAP in the stable preterm baby. But the, the early trials that are coming out are showing that nasal high frequency potentially can be used as a substitute for NIPPV uh, in this population of non invasively supported babies and generally as a way of preventing extubation failure. So in, in if we when we use nasal high frequency, we tend to we would extubate a baby to CPAP generally and, and then look at nasal high frequency or NIPPV as a rescue if that baby is failing CPAP and we don't want to reintubate it or we're trying to prevent reintubating it. So I don't know if that answers your the question there. It's quite broad. Yeah, broadly you explained it. Thank you so much. Uh, the second question is again on HFO. How advantageous HFO is as compared to conventional ventilation in management of PPHN? So in P yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in PPHN, it depends on the cause of PPHN. As I said, I said if you've got PP primary pulmonary hypertension without parenchymal lung disease, then there's actually no benefit of high frequency, and it probably is quite harmful because the disadvantage of high frequency is on the heart. 
the heart is used to beating in the chest um, in a, with a lung that's going up and down um, with conventional ventilation. And during conventional ventilation, our volume change in the chest is very high. And that makes the heart more efficient during expiration. So in particular, our right ventricular output is affected by that. In high frequency, we're applying a constant distending pressure within the chest, which is great for the lungs, but means the heart doesn't have that cyclical pressure release um, of um, thoracic pressure. So high, that's why babies tend to be a bit more wobbly on high frequency um, when the, because they don't have that cyclical pressure change, which is why I would never put a baby on high frequency if they're cardiovascularly collapsing. I try to fix their shock before I start them on high frequency. If you put a baby who's got blood pressure in the floor and no right ventricular output and a flabby non-contractile left ventricle on the oscillator, then you tend to get a baby that's even worse after they've started high frequency. So if you have no parenchymal lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, the oscillator is probably going to hurt your baby, not help it. Keep them on conventional. But the difficulty is that most babies with PPHN have some form of lung disease. And here's where there's probably, there is almost certainly a benefit of high frequency. So there's an old study now from John Kinsella in the US where he randomized babies with PPHN due to parenchymal lung problems. Um, so pulmonary hypertension due to pneumonia or something or MAS or similar or preterm issues. Um, and those babies were randomized to either conventional with nitric or high frequency without nitric. And then if they failed their randomization, they could be crossed over to the other group and have, and then if they failed that, they could have them combined as a therapy and end up on high frequency with nitric. And it was about 50% of babies who ended up on the combined therapy, I, I think it may have been a slightly lower number, but it was a very high number in that trial who ended up on both therapies, which means that one therapy alone didn't quite do it to treat the PPHN, but they were synergistic in that group of parenchymal pulmonary hypertension. And I think we've got to that point clinically. We've looked at the Australian and New Zealand neonatal network data, and if a baby goes on nitric, there's a 50% chance they end up on high frequency. Um, as well, which means, which I think is it means that we've already worked this out as clinicians without this trial. So I think in that group of babies with severe parenchymal disease, calming pulmonary hypertension, high frequency is very effective. Great, thanks, sir. Uh, so the third question is uh, related to the current scenario: Is HFO better for COVID patients in compares in comparison to neonatal? Well, we're we talking about neonates with COVID disease or, or, or all patients with COVID disease? I think you can answer this question on both perspectives. It would be better for the audience to understand. Well, I, I have to can. say, I don't look after adults with COVID disease. Um, I don't look after adults without COVID disease either. Um, and that the picture in adult, that the use of high frequency pre-COVID in adult disease is very complex. It hasn't been as um, promising as it has been in, in uh, neonates, and I think that's due to some developmental physiological differences. Um, ARDS in adults is not the same as ARDS in neonates. Um, so I, I, I have some caution about using um, high frequency in uh, making any comment about high frequency in adults because it wasn't an established therapy before COVID. We... In Australia, I'm on the COVID National Task Force um, here for Australia, and we did write the ventilator guidelines, um, evidence-based guidelines in, in about August of this year um, in our second wave. And we made a comment um, that from an evidence-based viewpoint, there is zero trials and only and very few reliable observational reports of using high frequency in children and infants with COVID disease. Those reports, though, seem to suggest that clinicians were using as rescue therapy when a patient had very severe ARDS as a way of um, preventing ECMO. And our recommendations, which is not evidence-based, was, was formulated to say that in a centre that uses high frequency to treat severe ARDS or respiratory failure with parenchymal changes with high frequency, we could see that there was no reason you wouldn't use high frequency in that population if it was due to COVID disease. But we've preempted that by saying 
that our statement is based more on the fact that we know that high frequency is good in other infectious disorders cause uh, diseases causing uh, ARDS, such as um, RSV and influenza. So we have to be very careful about saying that high frequency is, is something you should be using in COVID. I think um, what I would turn is turn the other way around and say, if you have a baby with, co if you have a patient with COVID disease, what is the pathophysiological problem that baby, that patient's presenting? Because not all COVID disease is the same. You know, we've all learnt this, haven't we? That the early days we all thought everyone getting COVID was going to have a, you know, direct ARDS and this pneumonic problem. And now we're seeing that many of them have got a myocardial or a coagulation problem and their lung disease is actually not their major problem. So I would say to you, look at the lung, look at the disease the COVID patient is presenting with. If they're presenting with a direct form of ARDS, so parenchymal changes consistent with ARDS, irrespective of the age group, and they have met the criteria for intubation and they're failing on conventional in, uh, ventilation, then consider high frequency as a bridge um, to prevent ECMO. Wonderful, sir. So uh, I'm moving on to the next question, and I, I hope the question has been answered very well by uh, Dr. Thinge. So uh, the next question is on closed loop oxygen control system. I'm joining two questions here. Do we have any study on closed loop oxygen control system? Its benefits against conventional one? And whether do you feel patients recover faster if closed loop oxygen control system is administered well? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to um, unshare my screen now. Um, uh, again, as I sort of alluded to in my talk, we don't when it talk when you talk about a trial that um, is there a trial that shows closed loop oxygen is better than one than not using closed loop oxygen control? Um, it depends on what the trial is aiming to measure. There's lots of trials now that have many many trials with all of the systems available showing very clearly that if your outcome measure is just maintaining your target saturations, closed loop oxygen clearly does that. Um, but what we don't have yet is a trial to show that closed loop oxygen reduces major morbidity or mortality events. So we don't know that if you put a preterm baby on closed loop oxygen on at birth and leave it on them, that they will have a less chance of dying than if they are not, if they're managed with traditional manual control. So we don't have those trials yet. As I said, there's one trial in the, that's recruiting at the moment, but it's not finished recruiting. Um, we, and this is why I was saying, so I think if, if your outcome measure is, uh, will, will the baby have tighter oxygen saturations? The answer is almost certainly yes, they will um, with closed loop oxygen. Then you as a clinician need to decide whether that's of benefit to your baby. And I think if you do, then it's worth using closed loop oxygen, despite the fact we don't have any long term outcome um, data. I, closed loop oxygen is, if you're going to use it on your unit, it's something you need to do with your nursing staff. Um, you know, I presented that data showing that the doctor, that nursing, that, you know, when we look at manual control, which is essentially nursing led control or, or respiratory therapist led control, we're pretty bad at maintaining oxygen saturations. If you left oxygen saturation targeting in the hands of doctors, it would be a disaster. We would be awful at it. We'd have 0% chance. Doctors, so it's oxygen therapy and oxygen saturation targeting are nursing led interventions. And we need to give the nurses some leadership in that. We've found in our unit with closed loop oxygen that the nurses need to have buy-in when you start it. If the nurses don't like it, they don't trust it, and they're not prepared to accept that it's something that will help them, then they don't support you when you start it. So I, I really strongly suggest that if you're thinking of using it, and, and I said we do now quite often, um, that you do um, work with your nursing staff on this. And it's interesting, the feedback we've got from the nurses when we've built this in, this, this sort of development strategy, many of the nurses said, you know what, this makes my life a lot easier because I now can really focus on preparing the TPN without the alarms going off all the time because I know the ventilator will deal with it. Um, and they like that sort of control that the machine has and it frees them up to do other things. Um, what, we, what I'd like to see is some data to see whether having closed loop oxygen reduces um, staff adverse event rates, because I think that would be really important and show that it's a valuable therapy. We've had some of our really experienced nurses actually turn around and say they don't like closed loop oxygen. 
And, you know, I remember one day where one of my very experienced and very well-educated nurses said to me, look, this baby with CDH um, who's on the oscillator, I would like to run this baby's saturations between 90 and 92, the lower end of the range, because we know that'll get the baby off the ventilator quicker. But the oxygen control system um, wants to run it at 94 uh, because, you know, at 92, sorry, because we've set the range at 90 to 94. So it always sits for 92. Um, and I and she would say, I reckon I can get this baby at a lower FO2 because I can target that a little bit lower accurately. But that emphasises nursing experience. So um, I hope that sort of answers that question a little bit with, with some detail too. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. So uh, here, I think uh, I'll take a pause and uh, thank you uh, for the wonderful session which you have given to us. And uh, from India, all wishes to you. At the same time, we have received lot many questions and queries which will be directly responding through email and getting in touch with you further on this. Because in the interest of the time, I will say a thanks and goodbye to all. I'll just say, can I say one quick thing? I just want to, there was a question about COVID. Um, Please. I, I've Please. sort of stayed away from COVID. Um, I'll just sort of bring up my blue jeans thing. If there are people who are interested in COVID, we are um, with with the European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. Um, we are actually running a, a registry of neonatal COVID cases at the moment. And I'm not sure in India if you're running a registry of neonatal COVID. Um, if you're not, we are looking at recruiting international sites. So we currently have a a number of sites in Europe, obviously, um, placing data in, and a lot of sites now have come in from um, Brazil, and um, we're integrating in with a number of other registries. So, if anyone in um, Europe, uh, in India, is interested in participating, it, it basically involves um, getting local ethics permission, getting a, a data transfer agreement, and um, and then getting access to our red cap. Uh, online server um, and then you enter each case in as you have them. It takes about 30 minutes to enter the data in. Um, we'd be very happy to have some Indian sites because I'm, I'm, I haven't seen whether the Indian data has been correctly co collected and I'm not sure what's happening. Absolutely, Dr. Thingy. That's I think the message is what we're doing. And um, next year I'll be pitching a, a randomised controlled trial to maybe to India as well around delivery room PEEP, but that might be for next year. Wonderful, sir. So I think it's a time to take leave and say goodbye to all. And we'll have you once more uh, as and when we decide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a good And thank you to all the audience. Thank you.